people don't, uh, in general, ask their pastor questions like these. Pastor, is it okay if I cheat on my spouse? I've been kind of frustrated with them lately. Pastor, I love my new car. It's brand new. It's gorgeous. Would it be wrong if I just bowed down to it a little bit and prayed to it? Or a question like this. Pastor, my neighbor told me that he really doesn't like my dog. Is it okay if I kill him? You probably wouldn't ask me questions like this or your pastor questions like this because the Bible's pretty cut and dry on these issues on what is right and wrong. But between right and wrong is this vast area known as a gray area, and I have gotten questions like this. Pastor, is it okay if I celebrate Halloween with my children? Pastor, is it okay if I play the lottery, buy a lottery ticket? Pastor, is it okay if I go to the casino and play a little blackjack? That are questions that I have been asked that fall into this area that we call the gray area. That's what Romans chapter 14 is dealing with. I would encourage you to turn there now. This morning we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. And, and in our series on Romans uh, of what the authentic Christian life looks like, what does is, what is your life look like when you actually apply the gospel, the good news that Jesus came and died and rose again so that your sins might be forgiven and you might have eternal life. When that gospel is applied to your life, we know it changes your way of thinking, it changes your value, it changes the way you live. And, and what does the Christian life look like when the gospel impacts us every day? Well, Paul, in beginning in Romans 14, says the gospel has an impact on how Christians disagree with each other. We're not talking about issues of, of sin of issues where the scripture says this is clearly sinful, this is clearly wrong, but what about these gray areas? Now, as I say that about the gray areas, I'm sure when I, when I threw out uh, Halloween this morning, there was probably some people here that went, wait, there's people that think there's wrong, or there's people that think that that's wrong, and there were probably other people here this morning that were like, wait, there's Christians that think that's okay? To participate. Wait, what are we? What's going on here? And this is the problem in the church in the gray areas. Our natural tendency, even as Christians, because of our old nature, our natural tendency is that there tends to be a spirit of rejection instead of a spirit of acceptance within the church. There tends to be a spirit of division instead of a spirit of unity, and so we divide over things. In the gray areas where we're like, I can't believe another Christian thinks that's okay. How can they not know that that's sinful, that that goes against everything that God wants us to do? Or there are people that say, I can't believe there are Christians who think this is wrong and they're uptight and legalistic. If we go all the way back to verse 3 of 14, just as a way of review, Paul has reminded us, he talks about a weaker and a stronger brother Again, the weaker and stronger Christian has nothing to do with uh, whether or not you're saved. It has nothing to do with your salvation, but it has to do with your understanding of the freedoms that we have in Christ and that our relationship with him is not based on works, but because we are washed in the blood of Jesus as we sang this morning. So the tendency is that, that those who, um, if, if you want to use the example I gave this morning that the tendency would be that those who think uh, participation in Halloween events is fine uh, for you and your children to look at another Christian who that bothers their conscience, uh, the tendency would be to look down on them and say, boy, they're just pathetic and legalistic and uptight and they've, they've got to relax. I, I just can't even deal with people that are that ignorant. And for those on the other side of the issue, to look at those who feel it's okay and to judge them and say, man, I thought they said they love Jesus. And I thought they were serious about their walk with the Lord and they can participate in a, in a pagan holiday that celebrates witches and, and all kinds of evil and occult-like things and somehow that doesn't bother them. And how can they say that they're Christians 
when they walk in this way. Boy, we, we just made it really practical, right? And Paul says, what do we do when we run into that? Now, the natural tendency is to divide over that. Our natural tendency right away is to go, who are those people that disagree with me? Because I need to straighten them out. They need to understand what God wants in their life. And God says, no, your job is not to straighten them out. And as we've looked over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a couple principles in how love helps us uh, deal with those who disagree with us in the gray areas. The first one we saw is that love welcomes all believers into the fellowship. If you are my brother and sister in Christ, as we took communion together this morning, if you're a child of God and you've been washed in the blood and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's what we need to know. And that's what matters. And so you're part of the family and we welcome you into the fellowship, into this body of Christ without reservation or without judgment. The second thing we saw is that love keeps me focused or love keeps the individual Christian focused on honoring God in everything they do. Take that example again of Halloween. Wherever you fall on the scale of that, do it because in your family, in your understanding, as you understand Scripture, you feel that is the best way for you and your family to honor God. That's it. Don't look around at what you think others are doing or how they fall down, but say, this is where God has led us. This is where, in other words, the focus is on your walk with the Lord not your neighbor's walk with the Lord or your fellow believer. And this morning, we're going to look at the third principle here, which is that love recognizes that I am not your judge. Love recognizes that I'm not my fellow believers or my fellow Christians judge. It is before the Lord that they will stand, not before me. Uh, Romans 14, 10 through 12. Let's look at that and be reminded of that this morning. Remember again, as we continue through this series, everyone involved here is a believer. It's not believers and unbelievers. Everyone here is a child of God. Um, and God says, here's how I want you to treat those with whom you disagree. Romans 14, 10 through 12. Why do you continue to pass judgment on your brother? Oh, you know what? Nope, stop. I did this at the first service. I want to do this again. We do, we do this every once in a while, and, it, and it's good to do it for minor stuff. So I'm going to ask you to stand. If you're able to, we're going to show reverence to God's Word. Not that we can't reverence it sitting down, but we're going to stand. And let's read the Scripture together this morning. Romans 14, 10 through 12, God writing to, to us, to believers. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Heavenly Father, these are your words. We gather here together online this morning. We gather in person. We took the time to get out of bed this morning. We took the time to prepare for this moment, for this service, because we believe that your words are truth, and we treasure the truth of your words. We love the truth of your words. Father, even when it's painful, even when it's convicting to us sometimes, and so we ask once again this morning, Heavenly Father, because you are the way, the truth, and the life, will you guide us into the truth of your word this morning? so that we might live as people of you, so that we might live as people of the gospel. For this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So Paul says, Christians, when you disagree, when you come to the gray areas, when you come to some of these questions, how should you treat those with whom you disagree? And this morning he says, Love, or the gospel, as it influences and impacts your life, should cause you to be non-judgmental, not worry about where your fellow believer falls on the question of Halloween or lottery tickets or whatever gray area you want to put into that example, but instead recognize that you are going to answer to God for your conduct, and so focus on your conduct 
that you have a clear conscience and you feel good before the Lord in what you do. In other words, don't judge your fellow believer. Some of us live as if verse 12 says, so then each one of us will give an account of his brother and sister to God. Now, we don't actually read the verse like that, but we live like that. We think that we are the judge. We think that, we, that, that God has given us the mission of making sure that our fellow believers know what is right and how they should live. And God strongly here in this passage says, you're not the judge of your fellow Christians. You know why? I have that job. He says, I am the judge of both the living and the dead. He says, of, especially of the believer you are going to stand before me someday and give an account. Now, we need to make sure we understand a couple of things here. We read earlier in Romans chapter 8 that there is no judgment on the believer. That for those who are in Jesus Christ, for those who have accepted the gospel, we have passed from judgment into life. That is correct, and that's in the area of salvation. The judgment that Paul is referring to here that God is speaking of is a judgment that Christians will stand before it. Let me back up for a second. That, ju- that kind of judgment will happen to unbelievers, the Scripture says, that they will stand before God someday and, and they will answer for why they have rejected Jesus Christ, why they have rejected the gospel. Believers will not do that. We've been prejudged. We've been judged holy and righteous and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. But there's another judgment for believers which is a judgment of reward. We're going to stand before God someday and answer for what we have done with our lives, for what, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze here. Maybe not. We're going to answer to God for what we have done in terms of ministry in our lives. Let me remind you again, uh, ministry is not what you do for Jesus Christ. Ministry is what Jesus Christ does through you. Ministry is not something that we generate in our own strength, in our own understanding, by our own will. Ministry is is when we yield ourselves to the inner direction, to the inner leading of the Holy Spirit and of the Word of God. And so, in other words, ministry is not things where I sit around and say, I think I'm going to do this for the Lord. It's when the Lord prompts us and says, will you do this for me? And so our ministry is going to be judged. And what's going to be judged on that day for Christians is the things that we have done in our own strength and our own understanding because we thought it was a good idea and the things that God says, here's the things I actually prompted you and led you to do. And how that, uh, the illustration Paul gives of those two types, uh, of those two ways of doing things and how they're going to shake out is in um, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 through 15, and we read this. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul says, the foundation on which you build your life is Jesus Christ. Do you know him as Lord and Savior? There is no other foundation. It's not by being good. It's not by doing your best. You can't earn it. In other words, it's not by works. It's by grace through faith in the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ. That's the only foundation upon which you become a child of God. And then he goes on. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation (coughs) with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become revealed, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved through the fire. So the the illustration that Paul gives here uh, of the works of the believer, he says, "Once once you have built your life upon the foundation... The wise man built his house upon the rock, right? That rock of Jesus Christ. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, upon his own works and own efforts. That gets you nowhere. So Paul says, once you come to Jesus Christ, you've been washed in the blood, you become his child, and you begin to build 
on that foundation. You begin to do ministry. You begin to do works for the Lord. And he said, you're doing two kinds of works. You're either doing gold and silver and precious stones kind of work, or you're doing wood, hay, and straw. Those are two very different categories. The one category, when metal goes through fire, it becomes purified. It becomes shiny. It becomes pure. Uh, a precious gem is formed in the fire. Fire is not going to hurt a diamond. Uh, wood, hay, and straw, fire is going to burn that up and destroy it. And so if we go back to ministry, here's what God is saying. If the things that you have done in your life have been things that God has prompted you and led you to do, if they have been things that matter for eternity, if they have been gold, silver, and precious stones kind of thing, when you stand before the Lord, that's going to be revealed. The stuff that is of the flesh, the stuff that was selfish, the stuff that's of your old nature, that's going to burn away. And if anything's left over, those are the things that the God is going to say, boy, this was ministry. Thank you. You yielded to my prompting and you did what I asked you to do. Notice in that verse, what if everything burns up? What if you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then the whole rest of your life, you just did whatever you wanted to do? It wasn't ministry that God did through you. It was just things you thought that would please God. Paul says, it'll all burn up. You'll have nothing left. But guess what? You're still welcomed into the kingdom of God. You're still his child. You're still saved. You're still redeemed. You just have not done ministry. This is the context of what Paul is also saying to us here. He's saying, Christian, who are you to judge whether or not someone is truly serving the Lord, whether or not they're truly doing ministry? He said, that's not your job to say, oh, this is gold and silver and precious stems and, you know, this is wood, hay, straw and stubble and and." And Christians are, are funny that way. We have a natural, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, we have a natural tendency in the church to uh, be people of division and people of judgment rather than people of, of uh, uh, unity and coming together. Christians even like to say, I've, I've heard Christians say to other Christians, that's straw. They go, that's wood, hay, and stubble, what you're doing right there. And my, my thought is, and hopefully your thought, Paul, is saying, is that we should go, um, that's not your job. God says he's going to deal with that, and it's going to be by fire. It's not going to be by your opinion. And fire there, understand, that's not fire of judgment. That's fire of purifying. The Holy Spirit is fire. Our God is a consuming fire, and so it's going to burn away the stuff of the flesh and leave the stuff of Jesus Christ. So what Paul says here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is that love reveals itself when we refuse to judge our brother or sister in the gray areas. Because there is a judge that we will stand for before someday, and that judge is God. And he quotes from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23. Uh, the last half of, of verse 23 is what is quoted here. To me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance or every tongue shall confess to God. God says in Isaiah, he said, there's a day coming when every single person who has ever been, who is now today, whoever will be, is going to get down on their knee and they're going to confess, Jesus, God, you truly are king. You truly are Lord. And in that bowing down, there's going to be two groups of people. There's going to be the ones who don't have to be told and are going to willingly drop to their knee. And in fact, that's the first thing they're going to do is drop to their knee when they're in the presence of God and say, Jesus, you are Lord. You are King of kings, God of God, Lord of lords. But the scripture says to all those who have rejected Jesus Christ, who have rejected the gospel, they too are going to drop to their knees. They're going to proclaim the truth. Because you cannot be in the presence of God. You cannot be in the presence of the, the creator of the universe and not confess what is true. But that confession is an empty confession in terms of their salvation. It's too light. It's too late. I'm sorry. They're going to confess it because they must 
but it's not going to bring them any salvation. And this is the verse that Paul quotes, and he says, don't you understand, Christian, that all of us, your fellow believers and you, are going to stand before the Lord someday, and we're all going to make the same confession. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, your Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for washing us in your blood. And he said, that's what's important, that we are confessing the same thing, the main thing together, and it's before God that we are confessing it. But I want you to notice the, the verse before that and the verse after that. Isaiah 45, verse 22 says this, Turn to me and be saved, for I am God and there is no other. Do you hear the gospel invitation there? God says, Christian, or he says, uh, seeker, unbeliever, turn to me now and confess that I'm Lord. Do it in this life. Do it while there's time. Do it while there's opportunity to repent because you're going to do it one day for sure, but for some it will be too late. So there's an invitation here. It's not an ego trip by God. It's a statement of fact. And to those who do it willingly, there is salvation in his name. And then in verse 24, after every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, here's another gospel reminder. Verse 24, only in the Lord it shall be said of me are righteousness and strength. God says it's only in me that there is salvation. It's only in me that there's righteousness, not in your works, not in yourself, but only in relationship with me. And so he says, love doesn't set itself up as judge over our fellow believer. We have a judge, and it is before God that we stand. So how do we apply some of these principles in, in our own lives and in our time and in our culture? By acknowledging that life contains a lot of things that are cut and dry, that are black and white. I know you love your dog. I know your dog's the best dog ever in the history of the universe. And if your neighbor just goes, I don't like your dog, keep it out of my lawn, that's not a reason to kill your neighbor. And thank you for laughing because it's absurd, right? There are things that we know are right and wrong, but whether or not your kids should go trick-or-treating is a gray area. It may not be a gray area for you, it may not be a gray area for your family, but it is a gray area in the Scripture, in the kingdom of God. And so we cannot, therefore, try to turn that into black and white. You see, gray is hard. Life would be so simple if everything was black and white, wouldn't it be? And because it would be easier, some of us try to make it that way in order to deal with the gray areas in life. So we eliminate the gray areas personally, and make them very black and white, but then we try to impose that on other Christians. Life is filled with grays, Paul is telling us. As Christians, we want to do what's right. We want to serve the Lord. And did this service start at 1030? <laughs> okay. I just looked at the clock and I'm like, whoa, okay, sorry. As Christians, we want to do what's right and what honors the Lord. We want to do what the Bible tells us, but the Bible doesn't specifically address every issue, and we're just not sure whether some things are right or wrong. And to complicate matters, some Christians are convinced that some things are right, and other Christians are just as convinced that they're wrong. To beat my illustration to death, let's bring that up again. There are some here, I'm sure, whether here in person or here online, that when I bring up the trick-or-treating illustration, there are some here this morning going, wait, there are some people that think that's wrong? Like, what is wrong with them that they think that's wrong? There are others here or online who are going, wait, there are Christians that think that's okay? How can they say they love Jesus and participate in, in a pagan holiday or in an in activity like that? or a lottery ticket, or whatever you want to put into that gray area. And so the point is, don't focus on your fellow believer. If it's a wood, hay, or stubble, stubble activity, they'll answer to the Lord. It'll burn up, but you know what? We're still going to be in heaven together. They're going to be okay. If it's a gold, silver, or precious gem, guess what? It's going to last, and they're going to be rewarded. 
So don't look down on your fellow believer. Don't condemn your fellow believer who the Lord does not condemn. Living an authentic Christian life is a gospel-centered and gospel-driven and gospel-motivated life. And it is a gospel of no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And so Paul's point here as we continue to go through when Christians disagree, he's going, Christian, how dare you condemn someone who I do not condemn? How dare you not accept someone who I have accepted in the beloved? You are to treat them and you are to look upon them as I look upon them so that you are a reflection of me. Amen? Amen. Father, we confess this morning that the gray areas are hard. We don't like gray. We like black and white. It's easy. It, 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 there's no wiggle room. Father, in the gray areas, this is why you call us to be people of grace. We say it many times on Sundays because we need to be reminded because we forget so quickly it's not about you. Or we should say that so we understand it's not about me. It's about you, Jesus. It's not about my neighbor. It's about you, Jesus. It's not about my opinion. It's not about what I want. It's about honoring you, Jesus, and serving you. Father, help us to be people of gospel. Help us to be people of grace. Help us to love our brothers and sisters and to build them up in the body. For we ask in your name. Amen. What does it mean to be an authentic Christian? What does it mean to let the gospel impact and, and shape your life? It means that you are to be Jesus Christ to this world. God says, I, I'm calling you as an ambassador. You represent me. You represent my kingdom. So when people hear from you, they hear from me. When you impact people's lives, it's me that's impacting their lives. And so he's saying, dear Christian, you must accept those whom I accept. How can you judge those whom I am going to judge? That's my job. How can you condemn those with whom I have no condemnation? Accept them in the beloved. Accept them in the family. Be an agent of unity, not of division. And keep focused on those who are outside the kingdom. There are those who are in condemnation because they don't understand the black and white. They don't understand what it means that they're lost and condemned in their sins. Don't be distracted within the body of those who are on the same team and the same family, but be my ambassadors to a community, to a world who is living under condemnation, who are outside the salvation of Jesus Christ. As you go out this week, don't worry about who trick-or-treats and who doesn't trick-or-treat. That's a waste of time and nonsense in the kingdom of God. Let's concentrate on our neighbors and our co-workers and our children and our family who don't know Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.